Hello class, this is part four, chapter 42, part four. And in this last part, we are going to just take a quick look at um, uh, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, this particular point regarding section 16B uh, that has to do with short swing profits. And then we'll take a brief look at uh, corporate governance. All right, so looking at this slide, uh, you can see that um, Section 16B is another important section of the um, securities law that we're studying. This applies, though. This section applies to all officers, directors, or shareholders who own 10% of the corporation's stock. What I might sometimes refer to as a majority shareholder, we're not talking majority of shares but we're talking about a powerful shareholder who can dictate by virtue of owning about 10% of the shares can dictate uh, the direction of the corporation because they just have an outsized vote compared to all the individual shareholders who may own a few shares, all right? So these folks, any officer, director, or shareholder who owns 10% of the corporation's stock, they are required to report their ownership interest and any trades that they make in the stock to the SEC on a regular basis. All right. Now, what is this uh, section 16B about? It requires that these uh, these particular people that are connected to the corporation, the leaders of the corporation, that they hold their stock sufficiently long period of time. And that period of time is thought of as six months. Under the statute, it is six months. So um, if, a, if an officer or director or shareholder buys stock today, they can be expected to hold on to it for a minimum of six months. If they do not hold on to it for six months, then any profit that is made will be disgorged. All right. That profit is called short swing profits. That profit will be returned to the company, all right? So it will be disgorged or re and that means returned to the company. The idea behind the law is to encourage insiders to hold for the long term, not to be trading to make short-term profits. It's a very hard and fast rule. It's quite different from the rule 10b-5 that we study for insider trading. If you think about it, insider trading has been quite expansive and um, a little harder sometimes in, in some cases to define what exactly is actionable. Here, it's very cut and dry. Buy the stock. If you sell it uh, within six months, you must disgorge your profits. All right, let me go on here. All right, um, actually, there's one other thing I'd like to uh, just bring up before I move on to corporate governance. And that would be my comment that, well, how about if you are um, a shareholder and you own something like 13% of the stock, you bought an acquired stock because you were hoping to take over the corporation. So you bought it, let's say this month, September, and this is while this takeover is um, on, on the table and you're trying to acquire sufficient interest to uh, be able to control your target corporation, but let's just say you fail, all right? So um, this month is September, maybe by the end of October, you know you're not going to be able to get the kind of control you want, but you're holding 13% of the shares, all right? Where does that leave you? Under this rule, you're a, um, quote, majority shareholder, right, a controlling shareholder. You're going to be subject to this rule, 16, uh, section 16B. And that means that you may have to hold for six months minimum, all right, before you're going to be able to sell. So how do you get yourself out of that? Maybe you don't want to hold for six months. You know, you're off to bigger and better transactions, making money somewhere else, all right? What can you do? Give that a thought. This rule, this law is such that it permits the shareholder that I just spoke about that's holding 13% to reduce the holdings to just under 
sell off enough to just get under 10%, maybe take a loss on that, return your, disgorge your profits on that, but that leaves then the bulk of your ownership, the 9.9% .9 that you did not sell in the first part of the transaction. You can sell that 9.9% .9 now, and you're not going to be subject to Section 16B. You can at least walk away if there's any profit. Uh, you can walk away with that profit. All right. So you may take some loss. At least you don't have to take a complete loss. All right. We'll move on. Talk about corporate governance uh, briefly. All right. Um, you know, every so often there's a little more interest in the, uh, the principles of corporate governance. Um, this, when we talk about corporate governance, is about operating in a transparent way holding corporate leadership accountable for the decisions that it makes um, and trying to protect the investors, the shareholders, all right? So corporate governance, I have a definition here, it comes out of your textbook, all right? This is a system by which business corporations are directed and controlled. Um, uh, the structure specifies a distribution of rights and responsibilities among the different participants and it spells out the rules and procedures for making decisions on corporate affairs. This is kind of the, the ideal, okay, in terms of corporate governance. And, you know, again, I said this already, but it's about accountability and protecting shareholders from the kind of losses that we have seen when corporate governance kind of runs amok, all right? So this is kind of old now. This was, uh, uh, I think, kind of groundbreaking, all right, in uh, 2002. All right. It came on the heels of the one of the biggest corporate scandals, um, you know, in our history, uh, and that's with a company called Enron, which you have probably heard about. All right. Um, so uh, this was passed um, after the demise of Enron. It was sponsored by um, the Senate Banking Committee Chair Paul Paul Sarbanes. Sarbanes. All right, uh, and he put it together with a Republican representative from Ohio, Mr. Oxley, all right? So it passed the Senate, and in this day and age, this is quite astonishing, it passed the Senate with 99 votes, 99 to zero, all right? And it passed the House 423 for and three against. So if you think about where we are today with such a partisan Congress, that's just pretty amazing that this uh, act, which is about corporate governance, had just about unanimous, almost unanimous uh, approval from our congressional representatives. All right. So what does Sarbanes-Oxley, what does it say? All right. It requires more disclosures from corporations and it sets uh, deadlines for reporting. Uh, additionally, and let me just see if I can expand my screen a little bit here. I seem to have, um, I hope I don't mess this up. Oops. Well, uh, what was cut off a bit down there at the bottom is that it also set up this public company accounting oversight board, um, which was to oversee how is information um, prepared and what is reported, all right? Now, uh, I, I have to say, you know, other than reading about this in your text, I've not done a lot of extra study to see how effective uh, any of the measures contained in Sarbanes-Oxley have been over the last 20 years. I'm sure uh, some of the um, professors at business schools, someone has taken it on, some uh, professors perhaps in ethics as well, just to take a look, all right, at how successful. I don't think there's been a lot, a lot of attention uh, regarding um, some of the things that Sarbanes-Oxley um, requires, but um, it, it's still something that's on our books. All right. Now, in addition, Sarbanes-Oxley requires CEOs and CFOs take personal responsibility for the financial representations that are made by the corporation, right? This was probably intended to put a little fear, okay? into uh, these uh, high-level uh, corporate officers who would uh, sign off and then when um, confronted with maybe the omission or misrepresentation in these financial statements would say, well, you know, I have a staff that prepare this for me. I do not prepare them myself. I just sign off. So that no longer is going to be a defense. 
CEOs and CFOs, they have to understand what they're signing and they are certifying them in front of the SEC. They will be personally responsible should there be um, any errors or omissions. All right. Um, continuing, just what, what else is in Sarbanes-Oxley? There's protection for whistleblowers for reporting securities violations. There's uh, quite a bit of enhanced penalties, larger fines, incarceration, even both uh, for corporate um, uh, managers, all right? Um, and like I said earlier, it was passed in response to the fallout and the whole demise, all right, of uh, Enron. All right, let me just continue here. Oops, sorry, class. That was not intended. All right, and here is our last slide. I want to just close out from the corporate governance. Let me see if I can get this back uh, to full slide. And I want to introduce you to a last term for the chapter. This is the term blue sky laws. All right, this is the term used to refer to any state securities law. So California, Texas, Nevada, you know, we have our own securities laws. And so the, ref, the term used for those state securities laws is blue sky laws. Blue sky, you get the image, right? The idea that when you make an investment, it can appreciate, the value can go up as high uh, as the blue sky. So unlimited kind of appreciation. All right, that will then close out, all right, our discussion of chapter 42. Uh, you have some overview now of um, the um, registration of securities. You have some overview of insider trading. And additionally, we've taken a brief look at corporate governance. So um, we're finished with chapter 42. I want to remind you the vocabulary is posted. Look in Canvas. And um, if you have any questions, you know, let me know.